Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Omar Samad. I'm Senior Central Asia Fellow here at New America Foundation and former Afghan diplomat. Uh, I'm really happy to see Full House uh, on a Monday. Uh, somebody told me that uh, our announcement said light lunch, so please excuse us if this does not count as light lunch. Uh, but I'm uh, very happy uh, today to have all of you here to uh, have a discussion with two uh, experts, if I, would, uh, if I could call them, uh, professionals, uh, and two individuals who have long-standing experience with Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the region, uh, not just as practitioners and officials, but also, I would say, as scholars. So they will give you um, their view on the current state of development and aid to Afghanistan and what the future looks like. And we're very happy to have Larry Sampler, who just a month ago, on this day, was sworn in uh, as assistant to the administrator in the uh, Office of Afghanistan and Pakistan at USAID. Uh, Larry uh, has had a long relationship with Afghanistan. I think I met Larry the first time in 2002 at the uh, emergency law jerga. And thereafter, uh, at the uh, law jerga for the Constitution, uh, he was then part of the UN mandate and mission. Uh, but uh, since 2001, he has uh, had uh, dealings with Afghanistan, inside government and outside, uh, part of it USAID, uh, but also uh, worked for a while for Creative Associates International, is that correct? Uh, but also uh, State Department, uh, the Institute for Defense Analyses, the United Nations Mission in Afghanistan, as we mentioned, and the OSCE. But the OSCE mission was to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And um, we are happy to have Larry here uh, tell us about what USAID is doing and intends to do at this critical juncture in Afghanistan and in relations between Afghanistan and the United States. And of course, this whole transition, very complex transition that Afghanistan is undergoing. We're also very happy to have Jared Blanc uh, who with us from the State Department. Jared is Deputy Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I don't think you have an anniversary today. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but you have also worked for, uh, on Afghanistan for a long time. And uh, your work right now is on international partnership, reconciliation, and political transition issues. Very complex, somewhat difficult, but with hope, let's say. Afghans, as you know, um, have always been very optimistic under the worst of circumstances, and they remain so. Um, also, Jared has worked uh, as a senior advisor to the special rep uh, since 2009. Previously to this, he has held positions with the Open Society Institute and for the UN, and has dealt with Iraq, and as well as Kosovo, the Palestine Authority, Lebanon, and Nepal. He's also on the Council on Foreign Relations as a International Affairs Fellow and a visiting scholar at the US Institute of Peace, where I used to be for a while, and an adjunct professor at GW. A lot to do, lots of work, very busy, I suppose, but uh, very happy to have you here. What we will do today, um, is start off with Larry, who we are told has some important announcements to make. For some of you who are, may have missed the news over the last 24 hours, he's already been in the news. So the announcement will pretend is a surprise, and we pretend that it's very good news, which it is. Uh, so Larry, I'll give you the floor, and then we'll have Jared say a few words before we sit down and have our own little discussion, and then open, up, open it up for everybody. I would urge everyone, please, to turn off your phones if you haven't already. Uh, and when we get to the Q&A part of this, I would urge you to please uh, be recognized and identify yourself in your affiliation. Thank you so much. Larry, the floor is yours. Thanks. I thank you. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come today and speak here at the New American Foundation and was thrilled to see that the ambassador would be moderating. I'm not sure that I'm as thrilled to be identified as an expert. 
especially when I look out and see so many people I've worked with over the past decade. Uh, Fatah Jabrakhail is here, a close colleague from Afghanistan, and others as well. Um, start with an observation. If you follow Afghanistan and the media, you're constantly bombarded with negative stories of corruption, violence, bitterness, and lack of hope. The media, and even some within the U.S. government, will tell you that 12 years of sacrifice and investment in Afghanistan are going down the drain. And they'll tell you that USAID is shoveling money out the door to corrupt Afghans as schools and hospitals crumble into dust and become money pits unsuitable for human use. So my first message today is don't believe what the press tells you. Um, I have both a responsibility and a unique opportunity because of my position to see Afghanistan and to know and to understand what does go on and what does not. I'm not naive. I do actually understand that our track record has not been perfect. And I do realize that the future for Afghanistan will not be easy. But we're not working in Afghanistan because it's easy. We're working in Afghanistan because it's important to U.S. national interest. We didn't expect it to be easy when we went in, and it won't be easy for the next decade of transformation. But Afghanistan is still important to the United States for the same reason that it was important on the eve of September 11th, just over a decade ago. And we now know the dangers of turning our back on this part of the world. Negative reports on Afghanistan are easy to write. In a country as poor as Afghanistan, emerging from decades of violent civil war, it's not hard to find a hungry child, a disgruntled farmer, a hospital that doesn't look the way we think it should look, or a school that hasn't yet been completed. And you don't have to go to Afghanistan to find politicians making fairly scandalous remarks in public uh, in the middle of a heated political debate. So as you listen to the remarks today, be skeptical. That's expected. But also be skeptical of the reports and the naysayers that come out. Hear their reports against the context of Afghanistan that is not prejudged to be a failure. An Afghanistan where the desires and aspirations of the Afghan people matter at least as much as the dour and pessimistic news stories and reports. And where, yes, things may go badly in Afghanistan, but we're not there to see Afghanistan fail. And the Afghan people know firsthand the horrible consequences of failure. They have, as we like to say, skin in the game, and I'm confident that the Afghans are here to see this succeed. It is an important tradition for me when I do public appearances to thank those who've served, specifically in Afghanistan, perhaps in the military, perhaps as a U.S. government civilian, and perhaps as an implementing partner. Regardless of how you've served, I want to recognize the fact and the consequences and the risk that you and your families have taken in support of our national service. Last week's attack at the Taverna du Liban and the consequences of that attack, and then we were heard last night of another attack of a convoy in Kabul, remind us on a regular basis of the risk and the consequences and the sacrifices that our colleagues in the field make every day in support of Afghanistan. 2014 has been billed as a pivotal year for Afghanistan. As someone who's been working there since 2002, I can tell you that every year is billed as a pivotal year in one way, shape, or form in Afghanistan. And I don't expect that to change. This transformational decade will be made up of a series of pivotal years for Afghanistan. But let me give you my perspective on where we are now and how far we've come in Afghanistan as a way to set the stage for the way forward. In my mind, one of the most telling metrics for success in Afghanistan is with respect to paved roads. We're going to talk this afternoon about economic viability and economic activity and growth. And in an agricultural society like Afghanistan, a network of roads is essential to building economic growth. Excuse me. In 2002, Afghanistan had about 50 kilometers of paved roads. That's not to say they were good paved roads, but they had 50 kilometers of passable paved roads. To put this in perspective, if you laid a map of Afghanistan over New England in the United States, that map would stretch from the Atlantic Ocean on the east to the Great Lakes on the west, from Maine in the north as far south as North Carolina. And in that space, in that area of operations, they would have one paved road and it would stretch from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. That's the geography and that's the amount of paved roads they had. The most le recent press report that I could find on paved roads in Afghanistan today is that they have 10,000 miles of paved roads. When the Taliban were overthrown in 2002, there really was no functioning governance. In fact, there wasn't much of anything that functioned. 
At the time of the Taliban, more mothers, infants, and children under the age of five died in Afghanistan than in almost any other country in the world, proportionally speaking. The number of infants and children dying have been reduced by more than half. Maternal mortality has been reduced by 80%. It's still not good, but it's 80% it's better than it was in 2002. At that time, less than 9% of Afghans had access to health care within an hour of their home. Today, that number is over 60%. And USAID has worked with the Afghans to train over 22,000 health workers so that when an Afghan shows up at a clinic for service, they, they, they get the medical services that they need. A cumulative result of all this investment in health is that in Afghanistan, over the past 12 years, life expectancy has increased 20 years. That's a phenomenal record in development circles, and it's worth remembering. In a decade, we've increased the life expectancy of Afghan mothers and fathers, and now grandmothers and grandfathers, by 20 years. With respect to education, under the Taliban, if a child was lucky enough to grow to the age of schooling, there weren't many schools to attend. In 2002, there were about eight or 900,000 boys in schools of various qualities and standards. Now there's about nine million students in school, and a third of them are girls. Equally important, and perhaps more important for the transformational decade, university enrollment has increased from less than 8,000 to almost 77,000. And we're going to talk more about how we support education at the university level in a few moments. Finally, I would be remiss in setting the stage for the way forward if I didn't call out the bold advances made by Afghan women in the past decade. In 2002, most of the advocates for women and for gender issues with whom I met were brave expatriate Afghans who had come back to their country to serve and to advocate on behalf of women. Now when I go to Afghanistan, I'm amazed at the number of young, passionate Afghan women who have completed primary, secondary, and university studies in the new Afghanistan and who are their own best advocates. And not just in civil society. I see them in business. I see them in government. They're in every sector of Afghan society. And that was just absolutely not possible in 2002. This is just a snapshot of some of the tremendous gains that have been made and that we must jealously guard as we go forward. We've given access to safe drinking water in Afghanistan. We've given access to electrical power to families and to communities that didn't have it. And in fact, we're building the capacity of institutions in Afghanistan to be self-sustaining. The Afghan power utility is well on its way to being able to collect and manage the revenues for the electricity that they distribute to make that a self-sustaining organization, a state-owned enterprise of which Afghanistan can and should be proud. A recent poll showed that 70% of Afghans said they were feeling more economically secure than they were just five years ago. Contrast that with the news stories we see in Washington. 70% of Afghanistans feel more economically secure than they did five years ago. And in a recent survey by the Asia Foundation, the majority of the Afghan population surveyed felt their nation was headed in the right direction. So I think I can say with some confidence that the Afghan people are comfortable and want to see progress. They do not want to go back. So speaking directly to people like my father and other folks in North Georgia and across the country who are here on webcast, it ain't as bad as it sounds in the news. There is progress. There are good things going on. Is it dangerous? Yes, it is, but that hasn't stopped us before. Could we have done better? Absolutely. But as I've shown, the sacrifice and the investments we've made have produced amazing results. Is there much still to be done? Without a question, which is why we're now going to begin to talk about the period of transition, as the United States refers to it, and then the transformational decade that the Afghans are quite excited to talk about. So if looking back is a trajectory of hard-won achievements and goals, excuse me, achievements that we need to protect, what does the decade of transformation offer and what does it require of us? Among other things, I think it requires honest and candid discussions about tough choices regarding the allocation of resources, tough choices about expectations, both on the part of the Afghan population and the Afghan government, as well as our own population and our own government. To be successful, the transformational decade will require money. Less money than in the past, but still large amounts of money. And we have to be able to manage that money in ways that are transparent and accountable to the American taxpayers. And that's not a small challenge in a situation in a place like Afghanistan. It will require strategic patience, balanced by firm commitments and resolve with respect to measures of success and relentless progress. 
But most of all, I think it will require a commitment to persistent engagement on the part of the civilian community as international militaries draw down. Absent this commitment, I'm afraid that we'll see Afghans beginning to hedge their bets. This may be in the form of flight of capital leaving the country, entire families that leave the country, or it may be in the shifting alliances as power structures in particular areas of the country change and emerge. Suffice it to say, hedging strategies on the part of the Afghan population will not in any way help us shape a transformational decade that we would like to see. So with an eye towards communicating our continuing engagement in Afghanistan, what does that mean for us right now? And what it means is that we'll continue to engage with our colleagues on the Hill to help shape budgets for the out years related to Afghanistan. Certainly commitments made at Chicago and Tokyo need to be honored. But beyond that, we need to give our Afghan colleagues some sense of what they can expect as the budgets are reduced. Some sense of predictability. In Afghanistan, we're looking forward to a successful and a credible election in now just under two months. Thus far, the United States contributions to that election effort have been just at $100 million. We make it clear with our investment that we're not supporting a particular candidate or slate of candidates, but that we're supporting a democratic electoral process that will be free and fair and transparent for the Afghan population. We'll continue to work with the Afghan government to help build the systems required for an effective state. So what this means is we will continue to provide on-budget assistance to specific Afghan ministries. Now, despite inflammatory reports to the contrary, our on-budget assistance does not put taxpayer dollars at risk. It does not result in money going to particular individuals or power blocks in Afghanistan. And it does not increase the likelihood of fraud, waste, or abuse. On the contrary, both in the immediate sense and over the longer term, our careful and deliberate execution of on-budget support reduces the likelihood of misappropriation. In the most immediate sense, USAID has in place for every direct assistance program a process of overseeing and safeguarding the money being distributed. We make sure that it only goes to the programs that have actually achieved the results they were supposed to achieve. And then when the money goes, it goes to the people who actually achieve those results. We retain control of the money throughout that process. Different ministries in Afghanistan have different strengths and weaknesses, and they've developed at different paces. And different programs that we fund are funded in different ways. But all of them have the same assurances in place. We begin with our own assessment of the risk inherent in a particular program. And then we build our mitigating measures and our safeguards accordingly. But at the same time, with an eye towards building Afghan systems that are able to prevent corruption, fraud, waste, and abuse, we are simultaneously building the capacities of Afghan ministries so that they understand and can execute the various complicated checks and balances. I can't tell you how disappointed I am and how demoralizing it is for our staff in the field to have so many reports and stories come out that articulate quite well our own assessments of the frailties of Afghan ministries, but completely ignore the efforts of the Afghans and USAID to mitigate those frailties. In the long run, the work that we're doing with Afghan ministries on budget will pay results. Now, one element of transition and transformational decade that deserves our attention is that of economic stability going forward. It is a meta-level requirement for success. Afghanistan simply must be able to generate coherent economic activities that will support their population and fund their government. We know this will not happen overnight, but as a pivot from the war years towards transformation begins, this is something that will shape our programming and our efforts at USAID. I'd like to talk about three programs that have recently been awarded as examples of how this transformation shapes the work that USAID does. The first is an Afghan trade and revenue program. This program is designed to support Afghanistan's accession to the World Trade Organization, or the WTO. It will increase Afghanistan's international trade, and it will generate revenue for the government to replace donor assistance. Accession to the WTO is a really big deal for a country like Afghanistan at their place in the development spectrum. Uh, studies have shown that for countries like Afghanistan that make the hard decisions and the regulatory changes required for WTO accession, they see a 4 to 5 percent annual bump in GDP over four to five years. So there is a persistent 20 percent increase in the GDP of those countries. Now, with Afghanistan facing the economic slowdown uh, driven by the departure of international military forces, that's a tremendous thing to accomplish. <clears throat> Supporting bilateral and multilateral agreements with the Central Asian republics, with Pakistan, and with India will also assist 
Afghanistan's economy and help it to grow in a regional way. And finally, this program supports a value-added tax at Afghanistan and assists them with tax collection. Again, regionally, Central Asian republics have seen anywhere from a 2 to an 8 percent bump in the amount of money that they're able to collect, uh, I'm sorry, 2 to 8 percent bump of their GDP that their government has been able to collect when they go to a value-added tax. So the Afghan Trade and Revenue Program will address economic activity at the macro-national level. The second program is the Regional Agricultural Development Program. It's designed to improve food and economic security for rural Afghans through strengthening key agricultural value chains and improving the policy and regulatory environment for agribusiness. It will focus on wheat, livestock, and two or three high-value crops in each of the regions where it will operate. This program recognizes that for a nation like Afghanistan to move beyond mere subsistence agriculture and make licit crops both sustainable and profitable for farmers, they have to focus not just on the work of the farmers themselves, but on the value chains that serve the business environment in which they operate. This program has been described as a from field to fork focus on all parts of agribusiness. Among other things this program is expected to do, it will benefit 400,000 farmers by providing access to better technology and marketing, produce a 20% increase in yields for wheat and other target crops, generate $43 million in new sales across specific agricultural value chains, create 10,000 new jobs, and generate new laws and new regulations and policies that will improve the operating environment for agribusiness in Afghanistan. So whereas the previous program focused on macro, national, and international things like the WTO accession, this program focuses on regional and local impacts. But it feeds into the national economy by increasing the quality and the quantity of agribusiness products being, being delivered. The last program I want to introduce today fits well into a transformational decade because it both builds on work that I've talked about and it's already been done, and also focuses on the needs of the business community and government going forward. The Afghan University Support and Workforce Development Program will work through 2018 and will take as its input the thousands of young Afghans who have now completed primary and secondary education and are looking for additional education and employment. It will seek to produce two-year graduates who will have an associate's degree in fields that are expected to be key to the sustained growth of Afghanistan. This may include public utilities such as power and water management and distribution, agribusiness and agricultural extension, and the business management skills required to facilitate small to medium enterprises as part of the burgeoning economic value chains. Specifically, the program will partner U.S. universities, the University of Massachusetts Amherst and Purdue University, to create 10 different university career and partnership centers at 10 different Afghan universities. These centers will represent a coordinated effort between the Ministry of Higher Education, local business and national business, and the American and Afghan universities to ensure that the education these two-year degree associates will have are both appropriate and marketable for the economy at the time. There are other programs currently in procurement that I can't talk about with any specificity that also reflect this shift from a wartime focus to a post-war transitional period. We want to make sure that the development going forward is sensible, sustainable, and developmentally sound. Let me conclude my remarks by addressing the issue of oversight, or as I'm often asked, how on earth will you expect to adequately monitor these programs when the international troops leave? The quick response would be it's going to be a challenge. There's no question of that. But we'll build on our experience from monitoring other problems and other programs in the dozens of challenging places around the world where there are no international troops present. This is not a new problem for us. It's different in terms of size and scale and perhaps complexity. But conceptually, monitoring programs in Yemen or Colombia or Niger are not really that different than monitoring programs in Afghanistan. But it is a challenge. We will be vigilant, and we will be adaptive and prepared for it. We know from experience that no single system of monitoring and oversight is foolproof. But we work with the unique context of each program to design a monitoring plan that's appropriate, multidimensional, that is to say it takes input from a variety of sources, and that will produce adequate information to allow our U.S. government direct hire employees to make decisions about particular programs. If we can't articulate a monitoring plan for a particular program, we will not execute the program. It's just that simple. If we can't monitor it, we won't do it. But as the plans are developed, we'll be able to tweak both the programs and the monitoring plan to make sure that we do have adequate oversight of these plans. 
I'll finish just by saying that the United States went to Afghanistan because it was important to our national interest that we secure the ungoverned spaces in that part of the world. That was important then, it still matters to us today. USAID represents a chance to build partner capacities in Afghanistan so that they will be able to join the global economy, wean themselves off of donor dependency, govern their population justly, and secure their own ungoverned spaces. Development, almost any way that you measure it, is a good and cost-effective alternative to eventually having to deploy U.S. soldiers. Now, as the military draws down, it's more important than ever that we communicate to the Afghans a sense of permanence. The people of Afghan, the people of Afghanistan, need to know that we will be there for the decade. Excuse me. <coughs> the people of Afghanistan need to know that we will be there for the decade of transformation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Sampler. Mr. Blanc. Well, thank you very much. I'm in the comfortable position of having very little to add to what Larry's already said. Um, I will just make three points, or really underscore three points that Larry has, has already made more eloquently than I will. The first is that we are in Afghanistan because it is important for our security. We went to Afghanistan because we faced a threat from Afghanistan. We are still in Afghanistan because it is important to us that Afghanistan be able to govern itself and secure itself for international security and for our security. The second point that I would make is that Afghanistan over the last uh, dozen years is a story of remarkable success. Larry has already talked about some of the statistics of that story. Uh, a 20 year, a 50% increase in life expectancy in Afghanistan, an 80% decrease in maternal mortality. These are, these are remarkable experiences in any historical perspective. Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to find another country, another place in the world that has seen this level of development, this level of progress in 12 years. And what's important to see about that progress is that it includes progress on metrics that we know to be the key indicators of sustainability, including women's education and women li women's literacy. So we, we know that Afghanistan over 12 years has changed. One of, one of the nice things about being in a venue like this is seeing so many people who I first met in Afghanistan in 2002, 2003. Larry, well, I guess we didn't first meet there, but we, we knew each other there. There are uh, any number of faces around the audience who, uh, for all of us who have been going back and forth to Afghanistan that period, it doesn't take these numbers to tell you that Afghanistan is a different place. One of the things that Larry didn't talk about that I do think we need to highlight is the change in Afghanistan's ability to provide security for itself. That in 2001, Afghanistan was a threat to the world. For years after 2001, it was not a threat only because of the investment of US and international military force in Afghanistan. Beginning last June, Afghanistan has been responsible for its own security. The Afghan National Security Forces have, in fact, been in the lead for security around the country. We sometimes talk about 2014 as a year of security transition. But in fact, the security transition took place in June 2013. We're living under it now. So there are wrap-up elements underway, and there's a continuation of the transition to the train, advise, and assist mission. But the transition itself has already taken place, and it's, it's succeeding. So the, this transformation of Afghanistan from a country that was a threat to the world to a country that was not a threat because of this massive continued international security investment to a country that is increasingly able to secure itself with our assistance, but, but to secure itself, uh, and therefore is, 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 is a contributor to international security and to our security, that is vitally important. And of course, all of the, the development progress that Larry talked about that I just highlighted, that's part of why the ANSF is able to do its job. And the third thing that I want to highlight is the, the good news that Larry has just laid out about how USAID is approaching Afghanistan today. So we've gone through a remarkably quick series of progressions as, Af as we've tried to think about how do you support Afghanistan. Right? The, the Afghanistan that we arrived to support at the end of 2001 looked so different from the Afghanistan in 2005, the Afghanistan in 2010, the Afghanistan today, that USAID has had to be remarkably agile in addressing the challenges and opportunities of each phase. And so what Larry just described is, the, is, is one step of a continuous process of making sure that the assistance that we provide, the assistance that we have in the pipeline, addresses the real requirements in Afghanistan. And so you're talking about providing assistance to, first of all, 
the priorities that Afghanistan has set. We, the Afghans have told us through any number of venues, including the JCMB, including Bonn, including Chicago, including Tokyo, where they need help. And what USAID is doing and what these three programs are doing is addressing the specific requirements that Afghanistan has identified. The second thing I, I think that all three of these programs are doing is bolstering Afghan political decision making and Afghan reforms. So this, this trade and investment agenda, these are things where we all know that, that international support is important, but it is neither sufficient and nor is it in fact the most important thing. The most important thing is for Afghan's political system to be able to make the hard decisions, to make the right reforms, to improve in areas of revenue collection. And if they can make those decisions, then and only then do our programs really become as relevant as they need to be. And so the fact that we are, we are identifying the areas where Afghan reforms are starting to get some traction and we are, we are putting the programs in place to bolster those reforms as they continue, I think that that's really important to take note of. And then finally, as Larry said, the fact that USAID is responding to a changing environment in terms of A, the government's capacity to implement these programs, and B, our capacity to directly monitor these programs by increasing the direct assistance and taking care of all of the transparency and anti-corruption measures that go, that go behind that, and also being creative about how we monitor our, uh, our, our continuing assistance. I think this is all tremendously good news, and it's obviously a lot for us to, 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 to be watching USAID with over the course of the next few years, but to me, looking at, at what we've seen from USAID we've seen in the development picture over the last couple of years and, and the organization's ability to respond quickly and intelligently to an amazingly rapidly developing situation in Afghanistan. That is, I think, the, the, the best vouchsafe for the kind of continuing program that we all know is necessary because, going back to the first point I made, the first point Larry made, the last point Larry made, because Afghanistan is important to us and is important to our security. So uh, with those very uh, brief remarks, I'm happy to uh, start our conversation. Good. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I, I, I want to start out by saying this is very good news. Uh, it is very good news, as, and I say this as an Afghan, uh, because I'm sure that when the news gets out to Afghanistan, if it hasn't already today or tomorrow, uh, people will realize that there is um, symbolism in this beyond <coughs> the projects themselves. Now, if you don't mind, Larry, tell us a bit about the significance of this at this juncture. And then I also would like to ask you a bit about what amounts are we talking about? Is this from previous sure. commitments and appropriations? Is it coming from new ones? Or are you going to submit new ones so that it's clear uh, to both Afghans and Americans as to where this is coming from and how it's being sure. deployed? I'll start with a second question first in terms of the funding. I thought Afghanistan politics was complicated and hard to follow until I began studying the U.S. budget process. Um, the, the way that the U.S. budget process works, we're now spending money from fiscal years 12 and 13. The way USAID programs and designs programs is often a year-long process. And so the, the programs that we were talking about today, the three particular programs, designed for those took most of the year of 2013. And the money being spent is previous year money, so it's 12 or 13 money. The, the budget discussion that's been much in the news lately is the Congress uh, 2014 budget process, which does show a remarkable dramatic reduction in funding. But 2014 money won't have an immediate operational impact until sometime next year. It's, it's in the future for us. So what now, what we're doing at the moment is working with previous year funding and then to answer your question about the symbolism of the projects, we're focusing now on programs that will carry USAID and our Afghan partners through U.S. transition um, and into the transformational decade. There have been really clear indicators, as, as Jarrett suggested, from the Afghan government about areas where they want and need assistance. One of the areas that we feel most strongly, and the World Bank would agree, is essential for this transformational decade to be successful is economic growth. So all three of these programs contribute to the Afghan-led economic growth that we hope to see in the transformational decade. Good. Can, can you tell us briefly, uh, to clarify, all monies that have not been spent so far uh, will be used 
in the forthcoming period, uh, or, 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 or will some of it be lost? Yeah, yeah, I'm not aware of any funds that will be lost at this point. We have to be very careful how we spend money and how we, uh, how we allocate it. The, the, money, the money can disappear. If, if, we, if we're not able to spend the money in Afghanistan within a reasonable period of time, the money can actually mm -hmm. revert back to the U.S. Treasury. And that's part of the job that my staff, who are actually incredibly good, um, focus on, is making sure that we're spending the money in ways that are responsible, transparent, and accountable, and that we're achieving the things that Minister Zakiwal and the government of Afghanistan want us to achieve, but then also that we're answerable to the U.S. Congress, that we're spending the money in a deliberate way so that Congress understands we are good stewards of taxpayer resources. And this is a multi-year appropriation. This is, how, how long will this uh, These programs are four-year programs four years. and five-year programs, okay. and, and they are fully funded for the four and five years. They will not be, um, well, th they should not be directly affected by budget changes. They should not, okay. Jared, uh, you both touched upon uh, Afghanistan going through transition, and, and one of the pillars of transition is the political transition, and the other is security. Security is almost complete, if we can say that, even though Afghan forces have, have taken over all uh, responsibilities, with some very few exceptions. Um, how do you think this, this new environment of transition, elections coming up, uh, this peace talks sort of being in limbo, how is that going to impact, uh, from your point of view, the economy of Afghanistan? Because obviously people are very worried and concerned in Afghanistan, and, and any news of aid being cut uh, or reduced is, has, has a huge impact on not just the economy, but also politically speaking and security-wise as well. How do you see that? Well, I, I'd say two things. First of all, there's no question that the most important transition for 2014 is the political transition. And I think from our perspective, uh, we're quite pleased at at how things have gone so far. Now, a lot of the hard work is still to be done, but the early indications of the electoral process and the political transition have been pretty positive. So one thing that, that I continue to find very, very striking is the fact that this will be the first election in Afghanistan's contemporary history where the legal framework has been entirely adopted by parliament. No piece of the legal framework has been adopted by presidential decree. And what's important about that is not that the old legal framework was, was bad. In fact, it's not all that different. What's important about it is that the political system has bought into the electoral process in all of its details. And that's not everything, but that is a hugely important first step. And I think you're seeing that already in the, the relatively trusting way in which the, the candidates and the campaigns are interacting with the Independent Electoral Commission, with the security services. So I, it, it, the political transition is vitally important. The election is vitally important. In terms of how things have gone so far and the tests that Afghanistan has faced so far, I think we all have to feel pretty good about, about where we are. Again, acknowledging that, the, that much of the hard work uh, still remains going into election day and of course even after election day as, the, as ballots are counted and as, 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 as people um, uh, accustom themselves to the results. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of, of I, I think the question that you're asking about confidence and what the decisions and the announcements that we make here do in, in terms of Afghan politics. Um, you know, I, I think that it's been fairly clear for several years that international assistance to Afghanistan is going to decline over the, over the next few years, right? We're, we're moving over the course of the transformation decade to a more normal assistance relationship. What I think we are all trying to achieve are gradual, controlled declines in that assistance so that the, the <coughs> achievements of the last decade are sustainable and extendable. And I think that that's exactly the kind of work that, that Larry is, is laying out in terms of these three new programs, that this is the kind of thing that we will be able to continue to do over the next few years. Now, a big part of this is on Afghan shoulders. If Afghanistan continues to, uh, to reform and to make the hard political decisions necessary, then you know, from, my, from my discussions with the donors over many years now, I have a high degree of confidence, actually, that we're going to be able to also meet our commitments and, and, that, the assist the, and that the change from in, in our relationship to a more normal development relationship will be gradual and, and will uh, enable that, that sort of sustainable change that Afghanistan needs. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Can I just add, I, in, for me right now, political transition is uh, even beyond the elections. I, I've experienced two Afghan elections. The, the Afghans have a way of making these things work. They, they may be painful, or they have in the past sometimes been, but I'm confident that the Afghans have done the things that they can do at this point to have a successful election. It's exciting to read the news uh, when I see it in English about the campaign period in Afghanistan. I don't remember this level of political excitement and, uh, and, and campaigning going on in the past, but I'm much more focused on setting expectations for the transition of administrations. President Karzai will no longer be the president at some point this summer. And there will be a new cadre and a new cabinet of ministers and new cadre of senior appointments in various ministries. And that has, a, that has an impact on the way that we implement aid and, and development programming. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done both to communicate to the community of, uh, of experts and community of technocrats in Kabul of what they should expect as the transition comes and to communicate to the U.S. Congress and the U.S. population. There may be a bump in the road mm -hmm. sometime around July or August or September where our ability to disperse has to be paused while we sort out with the new ministries how these things will go forward. Mm -hmm. But I, it's something that we look forward to with excitement and eagerness because this is the first transition from one administration to another in Afghanistan in my lifetime. And those are the kind of problems we want to have. Mm -hmm. Those kind of problems show progress. Certainly. Uh, <coughs> no, I, I follow the, the political uh, process and the election debates and all of that very closely. And, and one of the issues that comes up quite often uh, over the past few days since campaigning started last week is, is of course, uh, this challenge that you both mentioned of corruption. Uh, and and, you, and your programs are trying to mitigate this to some extent and try to find uh, uh, ways to uh, overcome the uh, corruption problem that exists within the system in Afghanistan. Now, it, in, an issue that relates to corruption, which is also a part of a nexus that exists in Afghanistan is the drug, the narcotics issue. Now, what, what can the U.S. do? Because there's a lot of criticism on the fact that billions of dollars have been spent and not, not much has, has changed over the last decade or so. What can you say about maybe future programming in this area? I'll leave part of the hard question for, for Jarrett, um, and, and I'll stall for a minute so you can think of a good answer. Um, no, uh, corruption, in my opinion, it, uh, and it's a pretty strongly held opinion on my part, is countered by strong institutional systems. You select honest men and women to serve in government, but then you shore that up and you guarantee their honesty by institutions that prevent and punish corruption. And that's what the government of Afghanistan is building. Uh, their institutions to date have been young, less than a, a decade old in some cases. We need to help them build the institutions as they continue to select honest men and women to serve in government. With appropriate institutions, dishonest men and dishonest women will be caught. And then the punishment set an example for others in government. So I, I think it's important that we continue building the institutions the way that we have, and we continue to insist on, a, on programming that is free of corruption. Mm -hmm. And that will help, I think. It, it won't happen overnight. It will be a tough road. But mm -hmm. and, and you're right, the counter-narcotics contributes to it. Um, and that's a complicated problem that maybe, Jarrett, you want to address? Just, um, just give us a name. Yeah, I appreciate it. The, it, it. Actually, before I get to, counter, to, to, to the counter-narcotics question, I just want to say, say a couple more things about, about corruption. One is that I think it's important to, to distinguish a little bit between what we in the U.S. government have to do in order to protect U.S. funds from corruption, and then the larger project of helping Afghanistan become a less corrupt government, right? And so um, it, we obviously take special care of, of, of U.S. funds, and then part of what we're also doing is a capacity building effort, as Larry says, to make sure that Afghanistan has the institutions to combat corruption across the board. And I would just go a little, even one step further than Larry and say that of course, part of the institutional question is, a, is essentially a law enforcement question. How do you identify and punish corruption? Part of it is also actually, how do you make sure that the legitimate institutions are there to replace corrupt institutions, right? So it, it, it can be hard to, to, to stem corruption if there is no legitimate uh, border tax collect collection service, right? So if the only way a local government on the border is going to be able to collect funds is corruptly, then they'll probably do so. If there is an alternative, right, if there's a way to collect appropriate tariffs, to get those tariffs to the center, and then to redistribute those funds to the, the provinces, 
then you start to have an alternative to the corrupt system. And I think that <coughs> that's, again, if you look at some of the things that Larry announced today, I think that's part of what you see, not just today, but over the course of many years of, of US assistance. You know, regarding uh, counter-narcotics, I, I, I don't think that there is, can be any question that the narcotics problem in Afghanistan is very difficult, and it can only have long-term solutions. So taking a look at any snapshot and saying, my goodness, you spent so much this year, and, and what exactly have you achieved? I, I, I think it's, it, there's no year where we're going to have a very good answer to that question. But again, if you look at, at uh, creating a trade space for Afghanistan in the region so that there is a possibility for legitimate economic growth, if you combine that with agribusiness development so that Afghanistan can recapture the role that it played as late as the mid-1980s of uh, a critical exporter of, of uh, dried fruits and processed agricultural products to the rest of the region, that's how over time you will, you will cut away at the, at, the, at the narcotics business. And of course you combine with that all of the law enforcement support and other things that are, that are necessary, but, but which also cannot have um, pure short-term success. Mm -hmm. Uh, what has been interesting, before we turn over to the audience here, uh, is, is the fact that most of the candidates and the responses point to political will uh, uh, in the Afghan context as being a prerequisite for fighting this these types of scourges. Um, last point that I want to bring up is why do you think, you, you alluded to the media as being, as not having given us a, a more accurate, fuller picture of what has happened in Afghanistan. Now, what can be done? And what, uh, you know, from the government's perspective, we all know that Af Afghanistan today is a very changed Afghanistan. I mean, the Afghanistan that I remember uh, in December of 2001 is not the Afghanistan that I go to nowadays and visit. Yeah. It's, uh, people have changed, the society has changed, the economy has changed, minds have changed. So why is it that the American public is not grasping this? Uh, aside from media, and what can be done? No, I think you know we're addressing a community of interest here. You've taken time out of your day to come and sit and, and, and have this discussion with us. I think we all have to become advocates of a, of a better picture. I wouldn't say that the media pictures in are, are inaccurate. They take an accurate snapshot, but it's a small, fixed snapshot that doesn't accurately represent the broader picture. So for those of you who travel back and forth, or those of you who engage in working in and on Afghanistan, I think we have to become advocates for what we see as the new Afghanistan. There is no question that it's going to be hard. There's just no question. There are going to continue to be bumps and problems. But I like to talk as much as I can about the positive exchanges I have. Now when I go see ministries, I make it a point to speak to the young staff in each ministry. There are often equal numbers of men and women. They're often as well educated as I am, and in some cases I hate to say better educated than I am. And they're incredibly optimistic and powerfully committed to seeing Afghanistan succeed. The problem is that the, the, the people of the United States, and I, I made a shout out to my dad and people in North Georgia, they don't have an immediacy. They don't have an, ex an exposure to that Afghanistan. So I think it's incumbent on those of us who do have that exposure to share it at every chance that we get. I, I don't think this is something that we're going to turn the tide on, unfortunately. I, mean, I think the mm -hmm. reporting will continue to be um, probably somewhat negative because those seem to be the stories that, that generate right. the most clicks and the most hits on the internet. Yeah, good. Would you like to add something to that? You know, the, the only thing I would add, Larry, Larry talks about his father, I talk about my mother. Um, my, my mother's skepticism whenever I talk to her is not so much about this case that Afghanistan is a different place that, than it was, right? She, she believes that, it's, it's hard not to believe, right? My mother's questions are always about, but, but is this sustainable? Mm -hmm. right? and, and I think actually that we have good answers to those questions. And again, I think that in some ways, the single best answer to that question has to do with the role that Afghan women and girls are playing in society, right? That if you, if you look at that in comparative perspective, that is how you tell that a country <coughs> is going to be able to sustain the changes that, that, this, that have, uh, you know, have been so remarkable, so historic over the mm -hmm. last decade or a little bit longer. And so I, I think Larry's right. The, the, the stories are accurate, but they're partial and they're going to continue. Mm -hmm. And part of what's incumbent on us is to make sure that we get out the rest of the story and also that we, we answer some of the legitimate, but I think in the end, misleading questions about 
whether or not this is just because of the, 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 the level of security and economic investment that we've made and that will, we all know, decline over time. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Let's turn over to all of you. And please do identify yourself. There's a gentleman in the middle. Thank you. Hi, Doug Brooks with the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, while we have seen some, uh, great talk by the way, but uh, while we've seen some, some real improvements, I think, in the Afghan security forces, uh, one area that we have not, at least our companies have not seen much of an improvement, in fact, uh, the other direction is the Afghan Public Protection Force, uh, which is what is used for the, uh, the security of a lot of the USAID's partners. Uh, and for anybody who plans to invest in the future, they're going to have to use this, this organization. Um, are we seeing any potential improvements in that? Are we seeing any uh, other opportunities for using uh, different kinds of security for investors in the future? Who would like to? I'll start. Yeah, yeah the, um, Doug, thanks for the question. The, the APPF, as you well know, was created by a presidential decree um, as a result of his considerable ire over what he considered excesses of private security contractors in Afghanistan. Now, it's worth noting that there'll be a new administration, inshallah, at some point this summer, and, and the new administration will decide how they want to secure uh, not just USAID contractors, but banks and public institution buildings and all manner of, of facilities and, and convoys in Afghanistan. Um, you know, I would draw it as an example of Afghanistan's ability to stand up a state-owned enterprise that does function reasonably well, DABS, the, the public electric utility in Afghanistan, is uh, well on its way to being self-sustaining and, um, and performing quite well. So we know that they can do it. APPF is a really difficult organization to manage, and I don't, I don't think it's going to be resolved quickly, but I'm optimistic that we'll find ways to work with them uh, as long as is necessary. Mm -hmm. Yes? Oh, no, sorry. Here in, sorry, we'll, we'll go to you later, <laughs> right after. Uh, Hamid Arsalan, National Endowment for Democracy. A quick comment first. I do agree with you that a lot of progress has happened in Afghanistan. I grew up in Afghanistan and I remember if you wanted to make a phone call in our neighborhood, we only had one land phone, uh, landline phone. And obviously we had to ask nicely our neighbor if he could call our relatives or our friends. But today when I go to Afghanistan and if I ask uh, my nephew that what do you want, who's four-year-old and says that I want an iPad. <laughs> so <laughs> we have come a long way. But uh, two quick questions. I just came back from Afghanistan last week uh, where I spent uh, a few weeks there and I met with many people. Uh, one of the things that uh, neither of you uh, talked about is uh, the bilateral security agreement. And that has uh, really affected everything pretty much in the country from economy uh, to uh, many other issues in the country. So uh, in some of my meetings uh, with some uh, high level actually government officials as well, uh, they said that uh, there was this proposition, I think that they put uh, to the Americans uh, that the agreement to be signed uh, by the two secretaries of state, you know, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Secretary of State here. Uh, I'm not sure how uh, accurate uh, it is or not, or the question is the legality of that, that would Secretary of State be legally authorized to sort of sign an international treaty, or it has to be the, the, two, the two presidents. Uh, the second uh, uh, point is on some complaints that while the Americans are uh, one of the biggest donors in terms of supporting the, uh, the elections and the political transition in the country, uh, because of the experience of 2009, they are disengaging themselves too much uh, from supporting the process. So, and they would be, like even in, in, in having, holding enough meetings with the IEC, for example. So if you have any remarks on those, I would appreciate, thank you. Would you like to take the, the first one and you take the second? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, regarding the BSA as a technical matter, no, it is absolutely not necessary that the two presidents sign. Um, the, the agreement can be signed by cabinet officers. Um, of course, we're not going to sign an agreement uh, unless the, the government of Afghanistan and namely the president of Afghanistan want it to be signed. Presumably his cabinet officers would not either. But as a technical matter, it doesn't have to be the presidents who sign it. Um, a, a, as far as whether there's been a, a you know, proposal on the table to sign it this way or that way, uh, our position is very clear, which is that uh, we would like to sign the bilateral security agreement um, immediately, and 
if the government of Afghanistan is prepared to do so at whatever level, we're, we're prepared to do so as well. But unfortunately, at this point, um, the, the government of Afghanistan has not yet decided to sign the agreement. We do think that there are um, important costs to that, and I think you've identified them. They, they have to do with our military planning, with our allies and partners' military planning. But most of all, they have to do with the, the, the confidence of the Afghan people going into the political transition. So we remain hopeful that, uh, that we can conclude the agreement very quickly. Yeah, I mean, with respect to the elections, y you've identified a challenge for us, which is how do we make sure that our support for the electoral process is robust and that the Afghans get whatever assistance they need for elections that satisfy their population without giving the appearance that we're somehow inappropriately interfering. It's a very delicate balancing act. And whereas one audience will say you need to engage more aggressively and more robustly, at the same time there'll be others who will then accuse us of interfering. So I, I have great confidence in Ambassador Cunningham and the Mission Director Bill Hammock um, that they are appropriately engaging. I get reports, Jarrett and I in fact both participate in an elections working group that's between Washington and the field. Um, and, and we get regular reports on, on the successes and the challenges that they're facing in Afghanistan. You know, certainly we would be happy to hear uh, through the embassy or through our offices here if there are particular areas where people think we can be more supportive. But just, I, I appreciate the fact that you understand how careful we want to be not to, uh, to give even the appearance that we have somehow inappropriately interfered in what is a, an institution the Afghans should be proud of. As Jarrett said, it's, the election is being run by Afghans according to Afghan law. And I think uh, come July or whenever the inauguration occurs, it's something you should be able to look back and be proud of. Thank you. So, I'm sorry, yes. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Gila Nouri from Voice of America, Afghanistan TV. Uh, my question is uh, coming back to BSA signing. And uh, basically, um, with this program and new programs that you announced with the new aid, do you need Afghanistan partnership in that? And uh, use with uh, troops withdrawal, does it affect your work in somehow? At the same time, there's a complicating factor of relationship with Afghan government. You're saying that you're uh, using this program through Afghan ministries. So these Afghan ministries, some of them are accused for fraud. And how does it affect your work? Does it mean anything that you want to have a stable and reliable partner to manage all this new pledge and aid to Afghanistan? Yeah. What's the partnership? Um, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll try and unpack that. Um, the withdrawal of the troops and how that will affect our work. I mean, certainly the presence of international troops over the past decade has been an enormous benefit to USAID um, and, and to all the partners on the ground in Afghanistan. Um, they provided a level of, of area security. They provided logistical support in terms of reaching difficult and hard to reach places. Um, but, but as I said in my remarks, USAID is comfortable and, and in fact quite experienced at working in difficult places where there are not international troops present. So while we're not, uh, we're not overly, uh, we're cautiously approaching the future in Afghanistan as someplace that we think we will be able to work. Um, it's a challenge and it's a problem, but it's one we've addressed in other places. Um, with respect to the ministries that we work with, we absolutely need a partner in Afghanistan. Now, our, our work is broad. In some cases, we work specifically with civil, civil society, with women's organizations, uh, with particular clinics or communities. Um, but more generally, and, and going into the decade of transformation, increasingly we will want to work with the government of Afghanistan. We, we break our partnerships down ministry by ministry, though, because our programs are generally applicable to specific ministries. Um, you know, the accusations of fraud are easy to, to field in a place like Afghanistan, um, but I'm confident that my team on the ground, the, the mission director and his team, are um, adequately safeguarding taxpayer dollars against any kind of fraud that may be there. So I, I don't take allegations of fraud as certainties, but we are absolutely uh, open to hearing accusations of that the USAID resources are being misspent, and we take immediate response when, when that happens. But to date, most of the ministries and most of the offices within ministries where we work, we don't find that to be a problem. To be honest, we sometimes find lack of knowledge and lack of understanding and perhaps even inadequate education on accounting standards to be a problem. That's not fraud. That's just lack of education. We can fix that. We can fix incompetence. We can't fix fraud. So we separate the two. A lot of the ministries in Afghanistan, because they are so young, 
there are adolescent ministries at 12 years old. They need the education and the technical assistance we provide. And as long as they're receiving that information and doing the best they can to safeguard our resources and theirs, we'll continue to work with them. Yeah, the, the question was, uh, could I comment on the SIGAR reports that, that allege fraud in, in various ministries? The, the latest SIGAR report actually cites USAID data that was collected by USAID employees with the full cooperation of the various ministries to assess weaknesses in those ministries. The goal of those assessments was to give us targets against which we could focus our technical assistance. It identified risks, financial risk, within each of the different ministries, and they were all different. We're addressing those. Every ministry has a mitigation plan that focuses on how, through technical assistance, we'll begin to close the gaps and to address the weaknesses. And then with respect to current ongoing programs, USAID controls the funds, controls the resources in ways that prevent them from being misspent. So I, I, I do fully support and, and, and appreciate the work that SIGAR does on the ground in examining these kinds of situations to identify threats. But in this case, these are threats that we identified ourselves, and I'm confident that our mission is on top of addressing those threats. What, what percentage of your funding goes to the ARTF, the Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund? You Which only you get to ask manage. me one question I can't answer in a given panel, and that was it. I, I, I don't know what percentage of no, our No, I mean, funding. I'm saying, is, is, for example, are these new allocations going to partially or fully? No, the, these new, the new programs are direct. They, they, they are not going through uh, ARTF or A. We have the Afghan Reconstruction Trust Fund and the Af Afghan Infrastructure Trust right. Fund. And none of these new programs are funded through those trust funds. So the, the oversight is, is on, on your behalf? It is on our okay. behalf. Very good. Uh, yes. Uh, Walid Ziad with the WORD, the World Organization for Resource Development and Education. Uh, first of all, I um, want to express my appreciation. Um, I had the, the great honor to be in about 15 provinces uh, in Afghanistan last year, and I appreciate your, your stress on presenting a positive yet realistic image as opposed to peddling uh, failed state scenarios which we see all too often. Um, the question I wanted to ask was with regards to the news that you have, uh, um, the very good news that you have announced. And I was wondering what impact this is going to have on uh, USAID staff on the ground in Afghanistan um, going forward in terms of numbers as well as the longevity of appointments. And then I was wondering if you could say any uh, words about um, any plans to increase engagement with Afghan civil society, particularly for monitoring and evaluation. Yeah. Um well, Jared and I both have staff in the field in Afghanistan, be they State Department or USAID, Foreign Service officers. Um, the, you know, the, the length of tour is an issue. It's a quality of life issue to some degree. The, these are uh, development or diplomatic professionals who, who are serving in a hardship tour. Afghanistan is not an easy place for an American to be right now. Um, so we have to balance the value added of extending the tour so that we get that continuity of effort vice the, um, the very real and significant desire of their families to see them back at home periodically, and, and the need for them to be able to come out of Afghanistan and, and adjust to a, a normal life. In USAID, we have countless professionals who are now on their second or third <coughs> tour there. So they, each time they come back, they bring with them the experience that they've had. With respect to engaging civil society, most of our professionals would like nothing more than to be able to engage on a daily and regular basis with Afghans. That was the best part of my experience when I was there during the early years was the access that we did have. Now it's my hope that um, as we enter the decade of transformation, we will see areas of Afghanistan like Herat and like Mazari Sharif where those kinds of engagements do occur, grow. Again, those are the stories that aren't told. In Herat, we have regular contact with civil society and with agricultural uh, extension services. We, we get out fairly often in Herat and in Mazari Sharif. Um, but it is absolutely our intent to, to make use of the growing educated Afghan population in terms of monitoring and evaluation and in terms of helping us determine what the community needs are for projects. Can I just add one thing yep. to that, which is uh, something that um, uh, one, of, one of my old bosses used to say, which is that 
if, if I were an Af if I were uh, in an Afghan civil society organization right now, I would take the Tokyo Mutual Accountability Framework, and I would blow it up into a wall size uh, tracking document, and I would be monitoring my government's uh, uh, implementation of its commitments, really commitments to the Afghan people. Um, reiterated to the international community at Tokyo. So I think there's a very important role for USAID and for the US government to play in working with civil society on these things. Uh, even more important than that is the role that Afghan civil society has in working with its own government. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Let's go on this side. Yes. Thank you. Um, Amin Nojan, MA student at SAIS. My question is, uh, some have said that the one of the reasons for the corruption that occurred, uh, or for the cr ongoing corruption, was that the country didn't have the infrastructure or the capability to digest the large amounts of aid that were invested. Going forward, as aid is reduced, um, could you comment on whether that could have unintended positive effect, or whether it's been reduced to an amount that would actually make the job more difficult going forward? Well, I, I assure you that any positive effect is intended. There are no unintended <laughs> positive effects. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that's a, that's a debate in the development community, and it's actually one of the interesting and intellectually stimulating conversations we get to have, is, is there a right size of development assistance for an engagement like Afghanistan? What makes Afghanistan an outlier is it was an engagement in a war zone. It wasn't just development. This was development in a war zone. Still um, I, I think, I think as, as aid normalizes over the transformational decade, and as Afghan institutions grow, I think there will be, uh, there'll be less pressure and less, um, corruption will be made less attractive. The opportunity will be decreased, the benefits will be decreased, and the, and the, the punishments, I think the Afghans will, we will, see, we will see that become more common. Can, can I just yeah. specifically though also take on this one question of, do we think that assistance levels are going so low so fast that, that uh, and I think the answer from both of us would be, the, would be no. That yeah. We're working very hard to make sure that both from the U.S. side and also more broadly with our donor partners, that this is a, a, a gradual, sustainable reduction in assistance so that Afghans are able to sustain the gains they've made in the last decade. You, you mentioned something, uh, the, donor, the donors, other donors, mm -hmm. besides the US, and US being the largest donor. Moving forward, how is coordination going to be improved on that front? I mean, what, are, are there any new ideas, new plans on better donor coordination, which has always been sort of a criticism that you hear from Kabul and other places as well. I, I mean, I'll, I'll start quickly and just say that, um, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the core sovereign roles of a government, especially a government in the developing world, is coordinating the assistance it receives from abroad. And so I think actually one thing that we've seen over the course of the, the four or five years that I've been doing this from this position is an increasing capacity from the government of Afghanistan to set priorities and to hold donors to those priorities. And I think that the Tokyo Mutual Accountability Framework is really an accomplishment in that respect, that it, it describes what the government of Afghanistan is gonna do, it describes the government of Afghanistan's priorities, and it lines up the donors behind those priorities. So to me, the solution to improve donor coordination is also improved governance. These things go hand in hand. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I'll add is, you know, in, engaging from 2002, the early advocates of this w were the Minister of Finance. The Minister of Finance himself would try and impose or try to direct donor coordination. The capacity now is, is uh, ma orders of magnitude greater than that. There are young, uh, young civil servants in the Ministry of Finance who will call me on the phone and say, this is what we intend to do. How are you going to bend your plans to support this? And it, it's frustrating, and it makes me gnash my teeth, but it's exactly the problem that we should have. The, the Ministry of Finance and the Ministries of Afghanistan are taking control of their destiny and coordinating the donors in the way that the sovereign government of Afghanistan would like them to be coordinated. So I don't always like it, but I definitely appreciate it as a sign of progress in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. In the back, uh, I see a hand right there on the, the very end. Thank you. Hello, Craig Karp, Carpology Advisors in UN Economic Commission for Europe. Hi, Larry. Uh, it's a long time. Um, I, I want to congratulate you on, on announcing this long-term plan. I'm sure that it will have a lot of impact in, in Kabul where they're waiting for signs of continued U.S. commitment. And I think that's really important. I mean, obviously, the, the accomplishments have been very substantial, and you barely get enough credit for what's been done. Um, 
I think a little bit, perhaps a little bit too much has been made of the whole corruption issue. I think which issue? Of the corruption issue. Yeah. I mean, if you look at uh, the films that are up for the Academy Award, uh, many of them are, uh, deal with the fact that corruption exists still in the United States here. So uh, I, I think that in the longer term, we'll, we'll see that, that that's less important. Um, the, the question that I have is uh, we've done rather substantial accomplishments in terms of helping the Afghans build infrastructure. And in fact, building infrastructure that didn't exist before. Um, the question is, um, will we be continuing to do work on infrastructure and particularly on infrastructure maintenance? It's a simple answer. The, the, the focus now is on operation and maintenance of the infrastructure that they have. Um, I, I don't want to categorically say we will not pave another kilometer of road ever in Afghanistan. It, it, but, but the need, the critical need in Afghanistan now is for, is to build the institutions that are necessary for a sustainable operation and maintenance plan. Largely the Ministry of Public Works with respect to roads, but other ministries as well. And again, that fits naturally into the, the, the continuum of development. They now have infrastructure that they own. We need to help them take care of it and teach them how to take care of it themselves. In the back again. Hi. Um, my name is Antoine, um, Antoine Oss. I'm a student at SAIS and formerly an advisor to the Afghan Ministry of Agriculture. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the necessary reforms in government that you talked about. I'm talking in particular in the civil service reform and how to dismantle the parallel structure that was created by contracted staff. And um, my second question, if I may, is um, your, your position or the U.S. government's position on the ongoing discussion in Parliament about the Afghan uh, women's uh, rights yeah. bill. Thank you. Uh, let me start with the, the reforms. Uh, so <coughs> when we, I talked about the ministerial capability <coughs> assessments that were done, and I'm, those are very specific to each, in, each ministry. There are commonalities. I mean, in, in, in virtually all the ministries, there's a, there's a strong need for a training in accountancy, basic fiduciary accountability training. Um, and that's being reflected in some of the education programs that we're funding and that the other donors are funding as well. So I expect that in the coming months or years, we will find young men and women coming out of school who have the accounting required to help, the accounting skills required to help these ministries. That would be one fundamental common to all ministry. Another, as Jared alluded to, is um, building a corporate culture and an expectation that ministries will function without corruption. Um, that fits into the civil service reform discussion as well. What does an effective civil service look like? Uh, anecdotally, when I was out in Afghanistan the last time meeting with these young staff in one of the ministries, I asked, how many of you are civil servants and your jobs will be protected by law when the administration turns over? And they didn't know. Um, so if, 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 they don't, if a civil servant doesn't know that his or her job is protected by law, the chances are there's not yet a culture in that ministry of what an effective civil service and an effective ministry looks like. So we have to build that corporate culture. And that's not something that can really be accelerated. It's essential, and you're right, we, we absolutely have to focus on that. But that's kind of why we talked about the two tracks, where we walk along with these ministries as they build that culture, helping to nudge it in directions where we think it needs to be nudged, and strengthen it in areas where they begin to realize and begin to accomplish what they need to accomplish. Um, with respect to the, the, the discussions and the legislation, uh, with respect to, uh, I believe it's CPC, I, you know, the gains that women have made in Afghanistan, in my opinion, will not be rolled back. One of the things that I redacted out of my remarks in the interest of brevity was there was a, uh, on our website, there's a photograph made in an Afghan girls' school of young Afghan women standing together talking under a banner that says in English up on the wall, the, the most wonderful thing about education is that it can never be taken from you. And in Afghanistan, we now have women, not young women and not girls, but we now have women who've got 12 years of education under their belt. Some of them, many of them have university training under their belt. I don't think that will be rolled back. Now, it, there may be challenges to it. I mean, it, um, it, there, 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 there are challenges. The CPC is a challenge. 
Um, but it can be equated to challenges that happen in the United States as well. I mean, we, we've had debates of recently over the recognition of gay marriage. In some states, they recognize it, and in some states, they choose not to. And it's being debated in the public. I, I don't necessarily see the challenges to the rights of women in Afghanistan as, as a sign of a bad thing. I see it as something that has to be fought and that has to be won. But the fact that these debates are happening in public forums is, a, is on the whole a good thing for Afghanistan. That's how, de that's how democratic progress is made, is by airing these grievances and these issues in places like the parliament and in the press. So I think now that they've been aired, they won't be rolled back. I can just mm -hmm. follow on the women's <coughs> rights issue. And, and just to say something that uh, I heard Secretary Clinton say many, many times, which is that in Afghanistan, women's rights are a strategic issue. And that's true for two reasons. First of all, it's true because Afghanistan will, be, will not be a society that, uh, that, that threatens the world if women's rights are sustained and progress. Right? That's, if you look at it in, in terms of Afghanistan, if you look at it in terms of comparative perspective, that's just flatly true. The second reason that, Af that women's rights are a, a strategic issue in Afghanistan is because the international commitment to Afghanistan is very much dependent on Afghanistan sustaining its gains in women's rights. And that's something that, that we as donors, we as partners and friends, have been crystal clear about at Bonn, at Chicago, and Tokyo. And it's something that I think the Afghan political system really understands. So to the extent that Afghanistan continues to need support, and it does, I think that Afghanistan understands that that support is dependent on several things, but, but really maybe first among them, certainly right at the very top, is sustaining the gains that women have made in the country. And, and the last thing I, I would say is just to go back to something that Larry said in his initial remarks, which is that the good news here is that as important as, as women's rights are to the international community, as important as our women, women's rights are to the, the people in this room, we are no longer the best or most effective advocates for women's rights in Afghanistan. Yeah. The, the best and most effective rights, advocates for women's rights in Afghanistan are Afghan women including the women who have started businesses, who have gotten education, who have, who have run four and one positions in parliament. And that's the good news in terms of why I think Larry's optimism is well founded. That is very good news. And uh, while you train uh, accountants, I urge you to make sure that the foreign ministry is not excluded. <laughs> I, I, for those. <laughs> uh, last question. We'll take this last question. I think, ma'am, did you have a question? or? No, behind you, someone. Okay. No? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Last one. You have. My name is Abdul Fattah Jabarkhil. I work with McClure Corporation. Sir, I work here with many Afghans, very educated and professional Afghans. That they came from uh, Afghanistan, immigrated here. They are doctors, engineers, geologists. Is there any program in the future? that we can use these professionals, send them to Afghanistan, and work there? Yeah, there, there have been, in the 12 years I've been engaged in Afghanistan, IOM ran a program at one point in time. There have been several programs to try and get professionals to, to relocate back to Afghanistan. Um, there are issues associated with the safety of those Afghans when they go back. Do they go back as Afghan citizens returning to their home country and, and resettle in Afghanistan permanently? And I think right now that's a bit of a challenge, to be honest, to, to persuade Afghans living comfortably in the United States that now is a good time for them to go back. That's the hedging strategy that I spoke about. I think over time they will see opportunities. As businesses begin to grow and as opportunities, financial and otherwise, begin to grow, Afghans will choose to go home. Um, a second venue, though, is identifying those Afghans who, who have become U.S. citizens who, or who who are employable as U.S. citizens and putting them on our payroll and sending them back to Afghanistan as U.S. government employees. And we've done that some. It's a challenge to do that as well for a variety of reasons. As you can imagine, an Afghan who goes back working in the American embassy um, will be quite constrained in his or her ability to get out and to see his or her family or to, to, to visit with his community, the community from which they came. So it's not something that's been ruled out. But I think as the transformational decade moves on, we'll see greater opportunities than we have now. Well, uh, we will stop here. And I want to thank both of you for a very comprehensive, well thought out presentation and your thoughts on the way ahead in Afghanistan. And again, as I said, this, this news, uh, this announcement today 
is, I'm sure, very well, will be very well received in Afghanistan. And it's also news to the American people and to the donors. So uh, uh, as we do, as we say in Afghanistan, Tashakur, thank you very much. And uh, I, I thank everyone for participating. And please thank with me our two guests, Larry Sampler and Jared Blanc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you.